so welcome everybody to this rapid response uh, about the DOTA's case uh, against Google. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that we have got this uh, up and running so very quickly. Delighted, Tina wants to um, wants to share this session. Thank you very much, Christina Kafara. I don't think you need any introduction whatsoever. Uh, so I'll just hand over to you uh, and and say thank you on behalf of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law and the Competition Law Forum. Over to you, Christina. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for hosting this and the British Institute. Um, the idea for this is really that, is, as Lisa says, we uh, thought and I thought that we really needed to raise the visibility of this event. This, this trial is being built, the trial of the century where Google finally gets to meet the full force of US law, the DOJ and the states. And yet, unless you have decamped for, to, to DC for the duration and are able to actually go to court or you read the specialist press, and the blogs that are produced, a few of them, um, pretty much are in the dark as to what is, is really happening out there. The mainstream press has stopped caring, uh, particularly in Europe, not much reporting is taking place. And so there was an initial flurry of interest for the first uh, couple of days, and then it's been slowly buried, in fact, quite quickly buried. We are halfway through this uh, trial, and the aim is really to uh, elevate a little bit uh, the visibility of what's happening and really talk uh, to those or hear from those who have the benefit of being in court uh, pretty much every day. So they are actual eyewitnesses to what is going on. Effectively, much more needs to, to happen, but we are halfway through. And so it's significant and important to discuss it. So we're lucky, as Lisa says, to have these three exceptional eyewitnesses today to the proceedings. I will introduce them and uh, I guess the introduction will count for disclosure because it's pretty much uh, clear where uh, they come from uh, and therefore the disclosure is inherent in the introduction. So we have Leanne Island, who's on the big screen. She's a well-known Bloomberg reporter, and as will become apparent in a moment, had also a particularly meaningful role as a protagonist at some point in the trial. Then we have Megan Gray, the former general counsel of DuckDuckGo, who has had a long engagement with the uh, issues of search, both in the US and of course in Europe, and uh, Jason Kent, who is the CEO of Digital Content Network representing digital publishers. My own disclosure, as many know, uh, I've worked as a, an economist, adverse to Google, Google on many matters. I was the main economist in Android, in Europe and in Russia. Multiple other cases have been assisting pro bono, uh, the state AGs in the initial development of their complaints. Now I'm not doing any paid work uh, adverse to Google. So with that over, uh, the plan is to try and structure the discussion along four main themes. A trial in secret? What is Google paying the OEMs for? How is the money effectively made? All of the advertising discussion. And finally, what if anything uh, could happen at the end? So let me start with uh, the trial in secret because in some way this is uh, the motivation for this. Uh, a trial is not in secret in the sense, as I say, that if you want to walk into the court, you can. You just walk in from the street and you don't even have to show an ID, which is peculiar. Um, yet the latest development, uh, which happened uh, last night, and Leah will discuss it with us, uh, is uh, a motion to intervene on the part of the New York Times and other, uh, other, other titles together with Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg. Uh, indeed to ask for more access to the exhibits. And if one sort of looks at the opening paragraph of that motion to intervene, it's, it's encapsulating in some way the reason we're here. Uh, the opening paragraphs reading, uh, the need for openness in this case, arguably the most important antitrust trial in decades with far reaching consequences for the future of the tech industry is both obvious and hard to overstate. Yet much of the testimony has taken place behind closed door and much other evidence remains out of the public view. Then he goes on to recognize the judge and the court have done 
something in uh, recent day to try to open this up. But let me turn to Leah straight away. This is in a way the culmination, right, of a saga which started unfolding from the, the beginning. There was no streaming uh, uh, of, of the trial. And then uh, a sense that a lot of the exhibits were being essentially held back, or they were initially posted, then they were taken down. A large portion of the trial is being uh, conducted on camera. And you, at some point, um, stood up from the gallery in a famously reported episode in which you actually address the judge and made the point that the kind of restrictions that were being uh, uh, seen at the time were unusual and against the public interest because the public has an interest in this trial. Let me stop here and give you the floor. We really want to hear your view about how this has evolved and where things stand now, including the latest developments from the motion. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I'll just say, you know, I have been uh, an ASS reporter now for uh, more than a decade. Uh, so this uh, these types of trials are not particularly new to me. I've done quite a few of them over the years. Um, but I think that this one definitely has been um, the one that has been the most locked down that I have ever attended. Um, it, Anyone who has attended a trial before knows that oftentimes there is at least some witness testimony that's done um, sealed because they're, they might be discussing the confidential financial numbers, things like that. Sometimes exhibits are redacted. But in America, there is um, considered a uh, courtrooms are considered a public place. They are part of the government and the press um, actually has a very specific role in court. We are considered um, sort of stand in for the public and um, have you know the rights as, as anybody would to um, ask for exhibits and things because we are supposed to be protecting the public's access to these sorts of things. So um, we did know in advance of the trial that some of it was probably gonna be sealed, but I don't think anyone was expecting the amount of secrecy that ended up happening. Um, so, you know, the first week sort of went according to plan. There's opening statements. Those are always open. There had been a couple witnesses, mostly done in open session, but there were some posts. But then when by the time we got to week two, they just started doing a lot of sealed sessions. Um, when we were working on the, the motion, there, there were seven days, uh, which by that point in time was one third of the trial. Um, that has been done in closed session. There was one entire day that was done in closed session. And that was just really difficult because uh, as somebody who just, you know, shows up, you don't know what their plans are for the day. You find out when you get there. Um, so all, you know, all of the reporters and people who were there from the public just showed up and then we had to stand in the hallway for the entire time when we had sort of expected to hear this Apple witness do some testimony. Um, so <laughs> my sort of famous turn uh, came because of the exhibits, because, um, you know, you, you have a right, the, the exhibits are all of the documents, uh, the contracts, the emails and things. And in an antitrust trial, those are really important because it, it might sound obvious to a lot of you all because you are familiar with antitrust, but at base, these are the things that the Justice Department is alleging are the illegal conduct or is you know evidence of the illegal conduct. And that ultimately is what like the public is interested in seeing, not just hearing the testimony, but seeing the actual documented alleged activity. Um, and so uh, the Justice Department had been posting these things every day on their website. Um, and then uh, the judge found out about that. He apparently had not known in advance. And uh, he said he didn't object, but he was surprised. And this led the Justice Department to remove everything from uh, their website. Um, <laughs> and when they said that, I, I immediately stood up because I, I, I had been taught since I was a young reporter that if the judge is going to seal a courtroom, if they are talking about access issues, you as a reporter and a member of the public have uh, the uh, obligation or you can ask that you have a lawyer come and argue on your behalf against the ceiling. Um, that's a very standard thing. Uh, and so I stood up and asked that Bloomberg have an opportunity to address the court on this issue. Um, 
He said he didn't think that was necessary. They continued talking. We brought a lawyer the next day, and that ended up being the day that the entire thing was in sealed session. <laughs> so Bloomberg's lawyer uh, got paid a lot of money to stand in the hallway. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it has continued to be a problem throughout the trial. You know, they eventually restored access to exhibits a week later. But... Um, Essentially, it hasn't been a very smooth process. They, some Google in particular wants you to request every exhibit you want access to by exhibit number. So you have to write down the exhibit number and all of this stuff and then send them an email. And uh, in general, they will respond to you two and three weeks later. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we had been talking about uh, doing something after all of these sealed sessions, these exhibits. Um, and that is sort of what led to the motion that was filed yesterday by the New York Times and signed on to by another uh, a, a range of other media organizations. And the New York Times lawyer also was allowed to argue in court yesterday. Um, we don't really have a resolution to that. Um, and the judge said a couple of sort of, well, from our perspective, concerning things. Um, he said he doesn't intend to allow someone to argue against sealing in the future, which is not really the correct process. You are supposed to allow uh, people to um, object to sealing because it's considered, you know, courts are considered very public things and, and there are only very limited circumstances in which they should be sealed. Um, and uh, it's sort of like the last resort to seal the courtroom if they, uh, if other steps haven't been taken. Um, he also, you know, he invited us to send some suggestions for how to change the exhibit order to um, make it uh, things more available. But um, he did say some things that are a little bit unfortunate, like perhaps we only have a right to see the exact page that a witness is shown in court. He doesn't believe that we would have a right to see uh, other things, for example, in the same slide deck, even though those might provide context or information about like who created that slide deck when it was created and things like that, which which makes it more difficult to understand what you're seeing if you're only seeing one page in a 20 page slide deck and you don't even know who made it. Um, so that remains unresolved. And, you know, the, one of the very ironic things, um, the New York Times, Steve Lohr, uh, has been uh, at the trial this week and he uh, famously, very famously covered the Microsoft case. Uh, and so he's been telling us a little bit about how this compares to 25 years ago. Um, during the Microsoft case, uh, there was only one day of sealed testimony. Um, and at the end of every day, they got printed out copies of every exhibit that was used in court. And I, I was mentioning, it's a little bit ironic that here we have a trial about the future of the internet. And because we want the electronic versions of the exhibits, it's taking three and four weeks to get them, as opposed to if they just printed it out on paper, we could have it immediately. So um, <laughs> I, I do know that, you know, this is this is the first of the three Google cases that we expect to go to trial here in the U.S. And so we're definitely paying attention to how this one is um, turning out and what we may need to ask for in the others to ensure this doesn't happen in those. So, so you indeed, I was about to mention that this is the first trial of the century, but indeed we have two more, which are uh, at least two more that are in the pipeline, the Virginia trial on app tech, and then there is the Texas trial on app tech, and there's a few more things. Is this a sign for how things will develop? Because it is clear that it is exceptionally difficult for reporters to actually absorb the content of some evidence which is fleetingly appearing on a screen and immediately taken down, but you cannot revisit at a later day. What does this do to, to your ability to follow this and to report uh, the trial, to, to ask the obvious question? Is there clearly a sense that uh, you, you are impaired and this is not giving the public ultimately a sense for what is really, I mean, you do your best, but, but how can anybody, including researchers, gauge what is really going on? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think that's one of the most frustrating things about this, right, is like, this is a trial right now, and in you, journalists, we are writing the first draft of history. So we are, we are, are telling you what is happening, um, you know, simultaneously, but this is also going to be a trial that's super important for antitrust law for the next century, right? So like a lot of 
And antitrust cases are, as everybody likes to talk about, highly fact specific. <laughs> so not being able to see some of these facts, it, it just makes it very, very difficult. And some of the redactions seem completely at random. Uh, yesterday, they redacted <laughs> data that was publicly available from an EU study about um, R and D intensity. We like found it online on the like all of the numbers. So we, like we have no idea why they're redacting some of these things mm. or why they're insisting we can't see them. Um, and it, it does. It makes it very difficult to adequately convey like what's going on because you have to you have to take everything down very quickly, sort of process it, summarize it, and hope that you are you understood it correctly the first time because you you can't you you do not have the ability to go back and look at these things. Even in the transcripts the next day, we've been getting transcripts so that we can read the actual testimony. It doesn't include include the exhibit. So you can read what somebody said, but you are you cannot go back and look That's at the key. things that they were looking at when they were talking about that. And that makes it really hard to understand particularly some of the very complicated testimony about like the economics, about how Google's ad tech system works um, without being able to see the, the descriptions or even, you know, some of these are demonstratives and things. It, it's very difficult to understand what they're talking about. Um, mm. So uh, we're, you know, as I said, that, you know, the next one is supposed to start um, in two to three weeks. That one is taking place in California, which tends to have much better um, public access rules than... That's Washington. the Google Play case, right? This is the Google Play case related to Android. Um, and so we're sort of hopeful that that may alleviate some of this. But, uh, you know, at this it's point, a it's a little knock on wood. <laughs> So let me let me thank you for, thank you for that overview. Let me bring in Megan and Jason. Of course, you've been going to court almost every day, and you've experienced this firsthand. What are your impressions of the process before we get into substance? Clearly, not satisfactory. But what is really going on, and what? Uh, well, I, I I wanted to remark on uh, just add on with Leah's comments. It is incredibly difficult to report on any trial in any context when you're only getting these snapshots, just brief moments of illumination, and it's delayed. So it's already stale, and you don't have a sense of of what you've seen. or um, So it is problematic not just for... Um, Europe reporting, European reporting on the case, but also in the United States. Even if you're in D.C., I don't think you're hearing very much about this case in the media. Uh, I think it ultimately stems from the fact that this judge from the beginning has not appreciated the importance of the case. And I don't think the parties um, worked to impress that upon him to set the stage for the ultimate trial. DOJ, unfortunately, was focused on um, being lawyers in the courtroom and not understanding the larger context of the case and planning for having exhibits, paper or otherwise, to reporters at the end of every day. This is pretty standard procedure for a trial team in a big, important case. And I don't know how that ball got dropped, but once it was dropped, uh, once we're at two weeks into the trial, it's hard to pick up that thread again because so much has really happened already. Um, and it's also disappointing that it's not being reported more in in Europe because of how often the European cases are being mentioned in That's this right. trial. Not only the Android choice screen, but also the UK CMA digital platforms report has come up multiple times. So this case is building on what Europe previously did. And yet it feels like a sense of apathy has set in. Yes, that's exactly how it feels. And Jason, yeah. your view? I'll just add one one thing, um, mostly nodding my head. The uh, the one other thing that's happened and, you know, and we did file, DCN did file a motion to intervene before the trial started. Um, about three different concerns that have played out kind of as we uh, were concerned that they would. And so thank, thank heavens for the, you know, for the times and for Leah and everyone speaking out. Um, the, the other thing that I've witnessed is that 
because you have such a thin number of reporters that are able to be present due to resource constraints, et cetera, other things going on. And also you need kind of a unicorn reporter that understands the tech and ad tech piece of this case, plus antitrust. Um, you know, you've got to Leah's credit, she's, you know, every moment I've been there, she's been somewhere <laughs> around there covering the trial, but there's, you know, there's a few, but, um, but you miss stuff and, and it's highly nuanced and, you know, and these reporters are human. And so if they miss something, there's not a way to cover each other, right. And make sure facts don't get missed. And the, the, the other point I make, just as you think about the other cases that are coming and trials are coming is when I do talk to editors, you know, they're not sending their reporters necessarily to cover it because there's this whole discussion, which I'm sure we're playing into here, that you can't get access to the trial. You can't just walk into the courtroom and it's going to be sealed and you're going to waste a reporter's day being there. And so, so there's kind of this knock on effect too, where even when the courtroom is open, there's not enough press there because they think they're not going to be able to get in and they can't huh. plan around that. So that's also problematic. We need to have, you know, 20 reporters banging at the doors, frustrated, standing up in courtroom like Leah's been to uh, to make a difference. Yes. And it's uh, even more remote in Europe. I take the point that in D.C. probably it's not hugely better, but in Europe where we have started many of these cases, there is no sense of uh, real anticipation when, in fact, uh, before the trial started, some were sort of indeed saying, well, you know, this is American justice. You're going to have real interrogation of witnesses in uh, in the public domain, and that is going to make a difference relative to the European more administrative process. But let's let's park that for a second. We'll go back to it. Um, um, I, I, I want to go into the substance, of course, now, and, and just to sketch in, in a couple of seconds what the, the framing of the case on the, on the two sides is. Of course, on the one side, you have the DOJ and the states arguing that the monopoly that Google has got in search results essentially for the, from, from the big money deals that Google has signed with OEMs, with carriers, to place Google search as a default uh, on the device. Um, and uh, the reason, of course, uh, is that default matters, and that's why Google is prepared to pay big money for it. This is the case uh, uh, that the DOJ is making, and it is anti-competitive because, in effect, it's a form of naked exclusion. It's okay to pay uh, for shelf in a supermarket, but if you are essentially the, the quasi-monopoly product and all of the supermarkets are paid by you, there isn't very much space for anyone else to emerge. On the other hand, of course, Google's position is that they are everywhere and they have achieved their position because they're just better. And this is uh, something that we heard over and over again. So really, uh, again, Jason, uh, I, I would like to start this segment with you I mean, in a sense, as, as the, the economic witness for the DOJ said yesterday, Professor Winston, a highly respected economist, it's kind of uh, uh, the question of why would you pay so much money uh, for the default position if, if it wasn't important is something that he said slaps me in the face. Okay, these were the words he used and were reported. But we've also heard a lot from, uh, from the witnesses about what is the importance of scale, of data, of, uh, of machine learning as opposed to data. Um, and this has been a live debate because of course, Google having that advantage in terms of accumulated data has been a long story that they would, would preserve this advantage. Ta give us, give us that, that side of things as it's come out in court. Sure. I mean, I think I think that to me, that as a witness and my observations, I, that's been fairly clear, the scale argument, um, both from witnesses from Microsoft, uh, you know, and the various industry participants, but also from Google and their own exhibits. And so, um, you know, we heard from Microsoft, actually, you know, Sachin Adele, the CEO, was, was I think, very clear and illuminating and, and sometimes entertaining on this issue. But but their CEO of web and ad services, um, Mikhail, uh, who runs Bing, et cetera, I think kind of broke down the arguments very clearly in terms of, you know, here's what you need to compete. You need a, there's a viability threshold. And if you're not above a certain 
share of the market, you just can't compete at all. You can't even participate in the market. And then at that point, scale is everything all the way up to like, you know, once you get above 80%, I think there was some agreement that there's diminishing returns at that point. But you know, he laid it out as, you know, you need location data, which, you know, is all about mobile. You need relevance, which, you know, his description on relevance, and this is Mikhail from Microsoft, was that it's all about query data. And you hear that from Satya too. That's the key asset is query data at scale that they can run, you know, you can run massive numbers of experiments, which only Google can do. And you can constantly tweak to, to, you know, to only lock up that position. And then the index themselves where the entire web is designing their services for Google because of its scale and therefore excluding, you know, the competition because they're designing their services to be best crawled by Google. And so, and then the defaults, um, which, you know, I think we're going to get into and why they would, they would pay for that. But, you know, the illuminating testimony to me was, was really Nadella was Sacha. And, you know, he talked about um, on mobile, the market was described as 97%. Uh, Google's was market share. Um, you know, I think Google's lawyers tried to, to challenge his use of the word dominance. And, you know, and Sacha said, you know, it's a Google web. It's not an open web. He said that, you know, I actually was struck by his humility, by the way, in the is it was versus, you know, I think the, the Microsoft uh, CEO 25 years ago, he's, you know, they asked him about like, you know, some of the positive remarks that Nadella had made about AI and how that could change things. And he said that it sounds like the exuberance of someone who has 3% market share. Like that was <laughs> in the courtroom laughed. And the, you know, I think, I don't know if that was the exact moment the judge laughed, but the judge laughed at some of these remarks. And so, you know, Nadella, Nadella is very clear that that scale is everything. Users don't go from site to site. And that's just, he used the term bogus, which actually that word bogus stuck out to me when he used it because we also spent time with, with Google's chief economist, Hal Varian, I think on the first day. Yeah. Where, and this is the, this was to me, it was like one of the most telling examples where the exhibits are so important that get shown in the courtroom in the moment was we saw Hal Varian working on behalf. My interpretation um, was that he was working on behalf of Google to kill off antitrust scrutiny and, and put out a statement that scale is bogus. That was the headline as part of an interview and then they pushed it out and they that was a big win for google pr was at that moment in time they got this whole argument that scale is bogus out in the bloodstream of the internet and and we saw the emails behind the scenes celebrating that and and we also saw the emails of of their head of engineering and some of their employees saying that's not true scale is hugely important how are we saying scale is bogus you know and so you saw kind of the internal fight and so that totally undermined google's argument there too so i'll let it sit there but i mean it was all about query query scale data scale and the feedback loop and why that's so critically important but there was also testimony from the head of machine learning at google wasn't there that in the end lehman i think was called that in the end Data is much less important after 2016 because machine learning has effectively replaced the accumulated, the accumulated benefit of the data. So this is the story that essentially is being pursued, right? Data is not important. If it ever was important, it is much less important now because we've got much machine learning, right? I think that's why we've had the discussions in court about user interaction data, that machines can only uh, function based on a foundation of the user interaction, what you've clicked on, whether you clicked back, whether you clicked through, whether whether your mouse hovered in a certain spot and for how long. Um, and from that raw data, then AI, machine learning, all this other stuff can come into play. But I think it's going to be very difficult for Google to really claim that user interaction data is not a vastly uh, critical input into this yeah. entire operation. That, that's yeah. it. Before I entirely pass that baton, I, I, I want to emphasize too, Sridhar, um, who was a senior executive at Google for a long time, Ramaswamy, who, who then started Neva, he was very clear on that piece too and connecting it to, to AI of like, you know, 10 to 15% of the searches every day are quote unquote tail searches that, that they've never seen before. And, and so in a world of needing fresh large language models and machine learning, et cetera, the user interactions to then go out and then target and scrape more information or to confirm information are critically important. And so, you know, it was, 
to me, it just locked in that importance as much as ever. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. I feel like that we need to add that this is the point in time in which Taylor Swift came into. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> <Taylor Swift. laughs> yeah. By the judge. Because the judge brought it up. By the judge. Because uh, <laughs> he asked a question like, so if I were to ask ChatGPT, who is Taylor Swift's boyfriend, it would not know the answer because it is actually not based on fresh query data. Whereas, you know, the search engine does because people are typing that in every day. <laughs> Excellent. So, so uh, le let me let me continue this piece uh, before going back to Leah uh, with with uh, Megan really. So, Jason talked about the scale data uh, side of things. Uh, of course, what's also hugely central to this case is the importance of defaults, right? In search, the whole case here is about payments that we that were made to place a uh, google search as default in in various ways and we'll we'll go back to it um and and the discussion has been a lot about what does default do right how does it really uh, achieve results so take us through all of that mass of evidence and the various points of view that have emerged in the discussion sure so in a in a trial like this that is many weeks long in which we're only having these flashlight moments of illumination, uh, it can be important to just structure the, the analysis on a couple of key points. There's a lot of discussion, for example, about market definition. That is critical to any antitrust case, but I think not really all that interesting to me because it's kind of obvious that what a general search engine is and what it is not. But Google is muddying the waters with this whole controversy, made up controversy about what is a general search engine. Um, so the hooks that I think are important to keep in mind are that first, there's only three. First, exclusionary conduct. That's the default agreements, period. There's nothing else. The case is solely about the default agreements. That's with the OEMs for Android, and it's for browsers, which is Apple's Safari and Mozilla's Firefox. Okay, so that's it. Everything else stems from that. The second one is whether or not the default agreements are anti-competitive. Without those default agreements, are you able to compete realistically against Google? And then finally, and what we have not seen very much in this trial so far, surprisingly, is the uh, rule of reason, which is very squishy. And it's a question of whether the any anti-competitive aspects of the uh, exclusionary default contracts are um, outweighed by the pro-competitive aspects like cheaper phones or better AI, et cetera. Um, so it's just those three. Everything else is a factor or a subcomponent of one of those three things. And it is going to be, uh, I think, interesting to see what Google's defense is. I imagine a big part of Google's defense is going to be uh, the rule of reason, that we live in a glorious, glorious Google world that is only possible as a result of these wonderful default agreements. And the default agreements are only giving the, the, the world what they actually want anyways. So that will be the theme of what I expect from Google's defense, but it is all about these default agreements and whether or not they are absolutely necessary in order to com compete. And that's why we've heard so much about um, the other search engines in Neva and why, how much money they're willing to pay for these default agreements. But the default agreements essentially uh, are a curious, well, they, they, they are a fact, but at the same time, the debate as I've seen it was also about whether default really matters. What does, does it actually, even the judge questioned whether they- But the, the, that, that question is whether or not they're exclusionary whether the default agreements are, are in fact exclusionary because it is still possible for somebody to go into settings and change their default. So is it really exclusionary? And we started the trial with Rangel's um, expert testimony about how that really is. 
Yes, in theory, consumers can go and change their settings, but everybody so understands. He's the, that sorry, he's the, he was the uh, uh, behavioral economist who was the yes. expert for the DOJ. Yes. Carry on. Sorry. Yeah. So, so all of these uh, peripheral discussions, again, are tied to whether or not these are exclusionary contracts. Um. Now, Leah, you, you uh, of course, were there when there was a lot of discussion of uh, the, Apple, the Apple agreement, which has been saluted with some uh, apparent surprise, even though uh, it was a surprise to me that people were surprised uh, <laughs> in, that, in that in Europe, of course, we've, we've had an Android case, which was only ever about payments to OEMs. There was never any kind of case uh, against or involving Apple and the agreement between Google and Apple. So this came to the fore in this, in this even though it is important, it is known and it was known, I think broadly that this agreement was in place because of course you have, you have uh, Google search in uh, uh, your phone. So tell us a little bit about that part of the, of the trial and how that, Apple testimony played out, how was it received and uh, uh, what was the dynamic there? Yeah, so the Apple Google agreement is something that the judge has said he feels is at the heart of the case. Um, and so whenever the judge actually makes a statement like that, it's sort of, you know, you know that you need to pay attention. Um, <laughs> but in part because of some of the difficulties with uh, the ceiling, so we've only like sort of dribbled out information about the Apple agreement. Um, because a lot of that Apple testimony was sealed. So now, now we have the transcripts of it, but we did not at the actual time. But um, so a couple of things we know about it, it's been in place for a long time. It was first um, created in 2002. And when it first went into place, uh, it was free. Uh, Google did not charge anything for Apple to use it. Three years later, uh, they renegotiated it and agreed to create some, uh, the revenue share. So in 2005, it's the point in time in which uh, Google started paying Apple um, for the default on Safari. And at, at the time, if you remember, uh, Safari was only available on Macs. Um, then when the iPhone was introduced and the iPad, this became much more important, obviously, because uh, mobile <laughs> had, had suddenly arrived and everybody wanted an iPhone. Um, so we've seen... Um, a, some stuff dribbled out about this. The most recent version of this agreement was renegotiated um, in 2016. And both Google and Apple maintain that this, this is a document, the actual contract that is highly, highly confidential and can only be spoken about in generalities. So um, the, people are not allowed to quote from it. People are not allowed to uh, use uh, direct numbers related to it. So we don't know how much uh, money Google pays. The Justice Department suggested that it is somewhere between four and uh, eight billion dollars a year. <laughs> it's B, B per B, year. B with a billion. Yes, this is this is what we know. Um, we do know a little bit about some of it. There is uh, a clause in there that requires Apple to support and defend Google if this agreement is ever challenged by an antitrust regulator. Hence, Which is exactly the case we have now. Yes. Uh, hence why Apple's people showed up. You know, they were subpoenaed, but one of the reasons they had to testify. Um, we do know that there is some kind of provision in there that prevents Apple from, or requires Apple to use Google in a manner substantially similar to what it was doing in 2016, which the Justice Department has suggested um, Google has been using to sort of prevent Apple from entering into the search market. So they can do the things that they were starting to do in 2016, which is introduce like on Siri, uh, you know, it makes suggestions when you start typing into Safari, it, it tells you that maybe you want to go directly to the website instead of going to Google and then going to the website, but that they can't like do anything more than that. Um, and uh, there have been a couple other small things that um, have sort of leaked into the public uh, through this trial about that agreement, but it has been very locked down. And, and that's why it's been a little bit hard to understand exactly what the agreement is 
and um, like how how each of them interpret it. Um, I mean, the Apple people said, of course, we we want we selected Google because it was the best search engine, and we think it's the best search engine, and that's why we use it. But we also now know that um, they had very extensive conversations about potentially moving to Bing. Um, they considered even buying Bing from Microsoft, which was one of the big reveals of uh, the you know Apple testimony and then Satya Nadella. Um, and uh, they discussed um, having DuckDuckGo as the private. Uh, so in Safari, you can you know search regularly or search in private browsing, which does not keep track of where you go. And they had discussed making DuckDuckGo the uh, search engine in the private mode, but uh, ultimately sort of abandoned that. Uh, the same week that the Google folks came to town to testify, uh, Apple released a new update to iOS. And in that update to iOS, you can now select a different search engine for Safari in regular mode and Safari in private browsing. Apple did not announce this uh, when they announced all the new changes in iOS. And it has been suggested in the trial that that is because the agreement specifically prohibits uh, Apple and any of the other people who've signed this from encouraging users to switch search engines. So even though it's a possibility now for you to go and select a, search, a different search engine in Safari, um, Apple wasn't allowed to tell you that. Um, <laughs> so it, it's been it's it, it's been a little bit like a, a puzzle trying to like piece together some of this stuff from the testimony because you know some of this has dribbled out with Google witnesses, some of it was with the Apple witnesses. But but the Apple contract has just loomed so large over this entire proceeding. Uh, which is is super interesting, right? Because you know this is this is a case about the the number four company in the world, Google, and its relationship with the number one company in the world, Apple, and also the relationship with the number two company in the world, Microsoft. And so, like all of these things uh, have been going together, which is why I'm a little bit surprised that there aren't more people here. But as I said, it is a little bit like a puzzle trying to to piece it all together from the various testimony we've heard. Oh. <laughs> Just briefly, what, I mean, I guess we will obviously see how the, the strategy of Google uh, for the defense unfolds in the coming, in the coming weeks, but uh, you must get a sense for what their position is from uh, the cross-examination or, the, or, or, or their interrogation of the witnesses. And uh, how, how uh, have you seen them dealing, A, with uh, the issue of, of uh, you know, there, there is a, a general position that defaults don't matter because you can obviously switch. It's a matter of doing it quickly that other people could pay. But how do they justify, or do you think they'll justify the payments and payments of that size? You know, again, to quote Winston, it slaps you in the face that if you're really better, you have to pay people to carry you. So how do yeah. you think, or how what have you seen uh, uh, being the argument there? They actually haven't, and you know, to be fair, we're not going to get to Google until next week, and then they will have, you know, three weeks. So we we've only been able to piece together a little bit of theirs. They have harped on that they are better. They have harped on that um, the other search engines like Dr. Go and Bing have not invested as much as they have um, to improve the quality. Um, and so this, you know, the reason they're not getting the reason they're not getting selected is they're they're not like putting their money where their mouth is. They're not trying hard enough. Um, but they haven't really tried to explain why they're paying billions of dollars to these people. Uh, on the Android side, they have said, you know, these payments are to invest in the Android ecosystem. It's to make manufacturers want to build Android phones and to compete against Apple. Um, for Apple, though, like this, this was a, a key moment in the testimony of Joan Bradeye, who is the woman at Google who negotiated the original agreement with Apple. And they said, you know, through this agreement, Google is paying billions of dollars to its largest rival in the smartphone uh, industry. And she said, well, we don't think about the payment that way. <laughs> so, okay. So, <laughs> so, so well, uh, Jason, how do you read that? What is your, your view? I mean, the bigger, the bigger question, um, you know, I did think Nadella at Microsoft's testimony was useful here too, where I think he said, basically, we're we're in the business of being, I'm paraphrasing, um, we're in a holding pattern, basically. We're sitting by 
um, until there's an opportunity. So clearly they've got, you know, nearly unlimited capital. If they wanted to get into the market, they, we saw testimony and evidence that they, that they were willing to spend an enormous amount of money to, uh, to take over the default. And, but he's sitting back and waiting. And for one of, of two things, and one of those things was the one he really leaned into, which was some sort of intervention by the, by the government. Right. So, um, so the fact that he's sitting back, even with that capital says that at least to me, that, he knows it's impossible to compete um, until antitrust enforcement plays out or legislation plays out. So well, I'll say that's I that. one of the best explanations I think of the whole case was uh, given by Tridar Ramswani, who yeah. is the founder of Neva. He's a former Google executive. And um, uh, the judge at the very end, he said, well, like, what is your like take on these payments? And he said, these payments create the incentive for the ecosystem to stay the way it is. Like these contracts are very complicated. They sort of freeze anyone in the C-suite from wanting to do anything that might um, get in the way of them because it's so much money. And so they're just gonna keep the status quo because of the level of money involved. And I thought that was really a, a good encapsulation of, of what the case is about. Yeah, and yeah. one of the yeah. One other thing, just to connect it back to Apple, if you don't mind, I, you know, this is where the secrecy really is a challenge because I personally didn't find Eddie Q to be a very reliable witness, you know, sitting there. And so I missed a lot of the testimony and including behind the closed doors because, um, because of the rules. Um, otherwise I was there. And so, you know, some of his answers, which, you know, kind of harken back to to Lena's point about everything's wonderful. Um, you know, he described the the ability to search directly from the location bar in the browser, which clearly pushed navigational queries towards Google, clearly drove more revenue to both companies. You know, he described that as just magical. It was a magical invention, the idea that you could search from the location bar. Um, you know, and he, in for the folks that have kind of watched on the privacy and data side, Eddie Q from Apple, he described like the, the, the question was, why don't you offer choice up front as part of the choice screens? And he, he described it as it'd be too complicated and confusing for a user of the device to have to choose their search engine. They wouldn't understand. And then he was challenged by the Justice Department why they ask users if they want to be tracked with what's called ATT. Um, and he said that, well, users understand what tracking is, but they don't understand search choice. And that doesn't, that didn't make any sense. If you're sitting in the room, you're like, that's, I don't buy that. So that uh, users have a Well, that. for what it's worth, I think it probably made sense to the judge because oh. if, if well, you'll recall, the judge had a hard time getting his head around the difference between a search engine and a browser. Mm. So I, I, while it doesn't make any sense to me, I mean, I can understand why Google is, is pushing this narrative. I think the more interesting aspect about why is Google paying this kind of money to Apple for the default setting is the fact that everybody is beating around the bush. Like that's just weird. Google has a story for why it's paying that money. I am assuming we'll hear about it during the defense of its case, but mm -hmm. I'm surprised that it's not already selling this story. And, and that we, at this halfway through the trial, we have to guess what that, that was my question. Is. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I suspect that what things are building up to, um, and this is just a guess based on breadcrumbs, is that Google will ex explain that it is paying this much to, to Apple by accident, that they started with this rev share when it was just peanuts and they had a certain percentage. And as they grew and as the pie grew, this amount of money just happened to grow as well. And they couldn't dial it back. So it was just a, a natural growth. That is what I'm assuming Google will, will claim. But Google has also planted some breadcrumbs implying that the Google Apple contract is more than just search, that it's part of a larger partnership. And perhaps the explanation is that this money is so so high because it really encompasses other aspects of their partnership, which we will not have any insight into because we don't have the whole contract. 
We don't even have part of the contract, really. And I would, I think we should see that even if you have some of the numbers and specific provisions perhaps redacted, because there's no way for us to verify that or, or, or kick the tires. Um, but also what has been surprising to me, Christina, is that DOJ is beating around the bush on why Google is paying this money. It is obvious that Google is paying this money so that Apple does not start its own search engine. Why would Apple want to go through all of the agony of starting a search engine when it has that sweet, sweet Google money, right? That is obvious. Why is DOJ not saying that? And why is not? So, Christina, may I just come in here very quickly? Yeah. Because we're halfway through uh, the case, more or less, and I'm wondering whether the three of you can just tell, uh, of course, I'm not going to hold to it, but, but how you feel things are going for the DOJ. <clears throat> well, <laughs> um, I don't think they're going great for DOJ, to be honest. I think DOJ, uh, this case has always been uphill. DOJ has the burden of proof. Like, that's all you really need to know. It, any case that goes to trial with this kind of impact on the economy, you have to appreciate that it is a, a difficult case in the best of times. I think DOJ has made its job much harder by not working to get public opinion into the case, injected in some way, because judges are influenced by public opinion. Judges are human too. And I think that was a huge misstep by DOJ. I think every aspect of the case can be rebutted as you would expect. Again, it's gonna, like if it was a slam dunk case, we wouldn't be here, it would have settled, right? Um, and I don't think DOJ has done a good enough job with preemptively taking the uh, accelerant out of Google's defenses. Um, but maybe that's a strategic choice and we'll see more of that during the defense side of the case. Leah and Jason, you want to briefly comment on that question from Lisa? <laughs> uh, I always hesitate to like predict how things are going, especially like midway through. I think there's been some pretty compelling testimony uh, DOJ has elicited. Yes. I think um, uh, Professor Rangel was a very compelling witness early on in explaining like why this matters at all. Um, for uh, for its worth, Satya Nadella was extremely entertaining, um, and uh, I think he was he was a very good witness. Um, he you know Google didn't wasn't able to push his buttons. Um, Sridhar Ramswani was also a very compelling witness, I think, um, just because of, you know, he spent years at Google, he, he understands his market extremely well, and he wasn't able to make a search engine work himself because of some of these constraints. Um, and so I thought that was really good and really uh, compelling testimony. Um, you know, Google is about to bring, I think that they have 14 yeah. of their employees that they're going to bring, including Sundar Pichai. So I will be very interested in, in what some of yeah. these very senior people at Google say. So, so indeed, I think it's too early to make prognostications. But uh, Jason, all that thought, uh, I want to um, move to another piece of the puzzle, which is, of course, we heard so far about defaults and uh, the user side, but uh, a big chunk of the discussion has been on the advertising side. Um, yeah. Of course, that's where the money is made. Right and uh, the defense or the attempts that I've seen uh, by Google to deflect this has been to say, a the market is not just a search advertising. There is a broader market where we compete with everybody else. We are not in a position. But the real issue here on the advertising side is that indeed the question is, uh, uh, is is Google pushing up the price of advertising? Uh, and and indeed pushing down what publishers get, and we we um, will discuss this in the uptick cases, but it's made its significant appearance in this case too, right? What did you make of it? Yeah, it has, and uh, not so much the how, the effects on publishers, uh, which is interesting because we're we've mostly been talking about their ability to Google's ability to manipulate price and and what they do to to drive up price. Um, 
but not as much about the effects on the rest of the industry, more on advertisers. So that is interesting to also acknowledge um, that, you know, the more Google grabs out of the pie, then it has to come from somewhere. Um, yeah, so, you know, the two witnesses that stand out to me, and I, I do think that this is very much a preview, and I think the Justice Department and the PR group, et cetera, should all be thinking about how this is instructive to the ad tech case, if it's um, in trial, possibly in the spring over in Virginia, maybe with even less access. Um, and also that case is to a jury. So they have to actually uh, explain pricing and ad tech to a jury, which will be even probably more challenging, but also um, kind of maybe a forcing function, I think, to to be able to uh, to be able to do that. And I think they've done that so far, by the way, in the complaint, they did a nice job on explaining it to the average person as much as you can. Um, the two witnesses that stood out to me would be Jerry Ditchler, the VP of ads for Google, um, and Adam Judah, who, um, you know, he's got a title around quality, but he's, he's awesome. You know, ultimately quality of ads, but ultimately he's the kind of the auction mind that would, that they put on the stand, um, to talk about how auctions work and, and, and how they can manipulate. And so, um, you know, I think, Ditchler's testimony in, in the email threads that came out uh, where you've got the head of advertising and the heads of search and the browser all on an email thread, you know, talking about how we have to meet the quarter numbers that the CFO promised. And therefore, you know, let's roll back launches. This will drive up price. And, uh, you know, and, and by the way, our employee morale will, um, will is a problem because there's a high cost of living right now in San Francisco. Like, it was pretty damning to me, like to see that sort of collaboration across what's traditionally been thought of as as, um, as church and state separation um, within Google, and that's the way they present it. That they're actually, you know, manipulating and and working to drive up price in order to hit their numbers um, for the quarter. And that they have, and that they have such ability to drive up price that it they right. have such a black. They call them box. pricing knobs, right? Tuning and yeah. pricing knobs. Um, you know, and they asked, could you drive up price by 5%? Could you drive up price by 10%? And the answer was, was yes. And so, you know, that to me is pretty, pretty telling. And then with Judah, we saw um, who was the, the auction guy. Um, we saw a few decks that I thought were really interesting. There was one with like Superman on it that, I mean, even the titles adventures in pricing was the title of one um, where they very specifically said, we need to extract more value from advertiser. That's what we do. Extract value from advertising. And we need pricing mechanisms so we can turn pricing knobs. I mean, that's literally what it says in the deck. And so when they called that launches, and there was wasn't there a discussion about shaking the cushions? That was the email thread. Yes, <laughs> we need to shake the cushions, right? Like we need to hit our numbers for the quarter. And should we roll back? And it was should we roll back this launch because it's it's not helping us? Um, but shaking the cushions was basically, you know, if they're doing. And this is a part of their 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 size and scale. If they're able to do, I think Ditchler said about a thousand experiments a year, you know, and multiple launches sometimes a day, like they can actually do things to roll things out, roll it back to manipulate prices, right? And manipulate the number of participants in the auctions, which is also interesting. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, you know, it's very hard to, to follow, you know, when they're throwing up formulas that, that haven't been available to the public before up on a screen. And then, you know, then you're fighting to get access to the exhibits, but it's very instructive for what's gonna happen in Virginia too. But so the defense, as far as one can, can tell at this stage, as far as I've seen it, has basically pivoted around either the market is broader than search advertising. And, and Lee, I remember one of your tweets memorably saying, if I see one more of the advertising funnel, I will scream. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of funnels. I'd ignore that. I mean, that <laughs> that's them trying to break down the relevant market for search advertising. And, you know, and they're throwing it up there and all the marketers and even public documents all say it still matters that you know, Google competes at the bottom of the funnel um, for performance-based advertising. And that's different than brand advertising. And they're just trying to use that. To, to me, they're trying to use it to confuse maybe yeah. the judge and, and bring in TikTok or Amazon or Facebook as competition. That's my read. Sorry, Christine, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it all goes to it can, is it possible for a general search engine to find other, um, other routes in 
and whether advertisers have substitutes for advertising on Google. And the idea that, of course, if they were not able for some reason to advertise on Google because it's too pricey, of course they would turn, they would advertise elsewhere, but that does not mean in an economic or, or competition sense that they are substitutes. So I, I think I agree with you, Jason, that that argument is going to be shot down pretty easily. Yes. But they keep trying it. They keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, you were saying? Yeah, I conscious of time and also there is a question uh, uh, from the sidebar if you want to uh, either read that question Christina or bring Tim in who has uh, asked that question yes uh, if Tim can unmute himself and ask the question but then I want to move on to the to the to the final section are you able to unmute yourself Tim I don't know if it's possible for participants, actually. Um, okay, if 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 we can work it out in the meantime, um, I would like to just actually move on to the final segment, which is which is to do with you know, in a sense, we're not trying to predict the future. We're 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 sort of halfway through, but there are we are we are we are seeing the shape of some of these uh things and one of the one of the uh points you touched upon megan is burden of proof what is really what is really that burden uh at the end uh how will the positive uh efficiency story if you like be be uh be offsetting uh, the arguments about anti-competitive effects. And also it's a trial which is in fact bifurcated, right? This is about liability and not about ultimately remedies. Remedies will come later, but it's also something I want to touch upon because it is always, and we know it in Europe, pointless to just develop antitrust cases that might be good. And in the end, you're left to sort of thinking, what is the remedy? We haven't got anything very good. And the case effectively is totally a waste of time as it has been in Europe, because we haven't been able to actually put forward remedies that were worth a damn. So who, who wants to, maybe Megan, you want to start with some of these points and then the others can pick up. So there's burden of proof, there is the, the, the bifurcation, and there is finally what could a remedy look like? Sure. Let, let me just start with the bifurcation because that was an early strategic choice by DOJ to bifurcate. Normally in a trial, you have liability and remedy that you they're combined. Uh, they're combined for the discovery phase. They're combined for um, deciding what expert witnesses, and of course, they're they're combined at trial. And uh, DOJ, for I think some very valid reasons, decided you know the remedy is going to be hard to figure out and very controversial. So we are going to put that to the side, and we're just going to do liability. And when and if we win, and this is also when and if it wins not only at trial, but on appeal, uh, then we will turn to remedy. And uh, the the flaw in that reasoning, and I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad uh, decision, I'm just saying there are pros and cons. The flaw in that reasoning is that it is not humanly possible for a judge to really put out of mind what a remedy could be. Because if a judge does not believe that a remedy is possible, then he's not going to be inclined to um, find liability. Uh, it, it effectively puts your burden of proof higher uh, that you have to establish to get a judge to rule in your, in your favor if there's not, if he doesn't see a path forward for a remedy. Um, so it's just, it's a complicated decision because it would have been very hard to, and very difficult to not get sucked into a sinkhole of remedy discussions in a trial. Um, so I, I personally think overall it was probably the right choice, but I think it would have been better if DOJ recognized that they need to find something for the judge to hook onto, um, to give him some peace of mind that things were gonna be going in the right direction. Um, and the, uh, on liability, um, you know, DOJ has the burden of proof and the states have the burden of proof. 
And um, there have been some skirmishes as part of the motion for summary judgment on the appropriate elements and who has burden of proof and when does it shift and when is it rebutted. Um, but these are very technical and I think ultimately not um, really instructive. I, I think my biggest point on burden of proof is that the plaintiffs, DOJ and the states, have to recognize that with this particular judge, I think he is holding them to a higher standard and a higher burden of proof than what he is supposed to. And um, it is because this judge has, has indicated explicitly that he gives a great deal of deference to Google and to business decisions, that he wants to stay in his lane. He is not comfortable with technology and internet he is not comfortable with making decisions on whether a piece of information is appropriately redacted for business confidentiality reasons. He is inclined to defer to those that he perceives to be more uh, knowledgeable in these areas, which happens to be Google. And uh, that's unfortunate. And hopefully DOJ is taking this into account as they build their case. Leah, I think what are your views? I was going to say, I think that's um, that's very true. One thing that I, I feel like we've learned very much about Judge Meta is he sort of approaches judging in a very Solomonic fashion. Um, you know, in all of the like leading up to trial hearings, you know, he would let Google complain for 20 minutes. He would let uh, the DOJ complain for 20 minutes. And then he'd be like, I think you should go and talk it out amongst yourselves and then come back to me again if you can't work it out. And uh, he doesn't, he, he often, I think, tries to have them work it out and then just present things to him, which you ultimately can't do in a trial. Like ultimately he has to decide. Um, I do think he, he, he definitely understands um, a lot of this. He asks very insightful questions um, and he does question the witnesses himself um, quite a bit. Um, I think DOJ has left a couple little breadcrumbs for things that they will not uh, seek in a remedy. The Michael Winston, who is their main economic expert, has been on the stand um, yesterday and today. And uh, one of the things he said yesterday is choice screens do not work. He he looked at all of the data from the European choice screen and said- And at Russia. Most it, it, yeah, and Russia. And he said at most, it's probably gonna shift 10% because we do not, you do not have a strong rival like in a country like Russia in a country like uh, I think it was Croatia there was a strong rival and there was a significant shift but in the absence of that it's, it's only going to be small so um, I think they're trying to get um, some of the like unworkable potential remedies out of the way um, there has been quite a focus I think on this click and query data and so I have thought all along that one of the things that the Justice Department could seek in their remedy is for Google to be required to turn over some of the data that it has to rivals to sort of improve their search engines because uh, I think it's going, sorry, someone needs their office back. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I will, I would say, Leah, I don't think that the, Win the Winston yesterday said that choice screens don't work. I think what he said was they, they have, have um, small effects in the beginning before the rival has an opportunity to establish a brand and a scale, a certain amount of scale. It doesn't have to be huge scale, uh, but even a 10% change in the market, I think would be a success story. Um, particularly if you had, you know, 10% shift in like two years, that would be pretty but massive. But as, as, as we know, I mean, the, the, although talking about the Russian case is always, is always uh, uh, kind of attracting a lot of a problem. I worked on that case and the reality was that in Russia, Yandex was sizable and it had been losing market share yeah. rapidly, but was known. And when the choice screen came in as a remedy, the choice was real. People heard, yeah. knew about that choice. When you are very small at the bottom, and indeed when you're made as in Europe to pay money to actually be in that list of those who are going to be potentially chosen, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really move the dial. I do. I, I want to just key off of what Leah said, uh, which is that the judge has been very curious um, and has been asking a lot of questions. I think that's the best aspect for DOJ 
is that he's engaged and interested and intellectually curious. I, I will say that he is um, not a very judgy judge. <laughs> he, he, he um, and, and eventually that will have to change and he's going to have to make some, some decisions, but that is his temperament. Leah is hoping to join shortly, but she temporarily just had to, to change offices, but hopefully she will join no shortly. Problem. No problem. Jason, what's your your final segment? We are talking about, again, you know, burden of proof and remedies yeah. going forward and where it will all end. You know, I, I, I defer to Megan and Leah on that. I think they hit it. Um, you know, one thing I would say is that uh, just to kind of emphasize i mean because i keep getting that question about the judge and because he's you know he's going to decide a lot right and you might not even be able to see the basis for some of his decision unfortunately the way things have gone um is my read is he's uh, very much um understands and is extremely attentive and you know i think he's had plenty of time as this case has built up to understand it and um and he doesn't show his cards at all to i think the point mm -hmm. megan was just making um so you know nothing nothing tips in terms of being able to understand where he might directionally be going on anything but but he is asking good questions and you know the one or two times that i think he's kind of caught me by surprise with a question that didn't make a lot of sense it was you know either misspoke or he corrected himself quickly so um, so that's very refreshing, by the way, for the the narrative that's always out there that you can't understand these issues um, if you're a judge or a lawmaker, et cetera. So, so that makes me very positive because I think the facts kind of speak for themselves on a lot of this. And the, the one last thing that I had in my notes as we were talking that I think is at least worth mentioning is the question, if it comes down to the, the deals and the Apple deal in particular, which is what we heard from Leah, it caught my attention that in the emails uh, between Eddie Q and I believe it was with Tim Cook at the time when Eddie was going in on his first negotiation of that deal, the renewal in 2015, which was you know 13 years, I think, after the initial deal, that his goal was to actually increase the revenue share percentage from Google. That was where he went into the discussion. And we don't know where it ended up, um, but because we didn't see the, the terms, but the fact that he thought and his goal was to increase the revenue share for something that, you know, Google doesn't even need to pay for, right? Because they're a better product is quite enlightening. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention that. Mm. Good. I think we are, uh, I don't know if Leah is going to be able to come back, but I think we can, we can uh, wrap it up now. I think we've touched upon. I, I, I actually have a, a question for you, Christina. I, oh. <laughs> with the Google Apple, uh, Apple is essentially playing the role of unindicted co-conspirator in this case, uh, given the importance of the Google Apple contract. And I'm wondering if you've heard anything about a potential case against Apple for this contract in Europe. No, there isn't any anything that I've heard. Um, you know, I, I have done work for Apple, but not on this matter. And I haven't heard about this. And the Android case at the time was really just about OEM payments and nothing more. So no. Um, I think what uh, what well, we'll continue to rely on you guys, you tweets uh, which are riveting at times, and uh, the articles uh, that that Leah and others uh, write. I think there is, of course, the next five weeks, five six weeks to play out. To me, what remains. Ultimately puzzling is this, this tension between we are the best, but we pay a lot of money to people to just have us. And so as the default, if you're the best, people should want you and you wouldn't need to pay them. But there is something more going on, which has possibly to do with a detente, keeping the status quo, uh, avoiding the, the cost of building an alternative. But there are alternatives, but they're not quite quite so good. So there's a there's a there's a there's a tension in the argument there that I think the judge will need to ultimately struggle with. Uh, and we'll we'll uh, certainly look forward to sort of seeing how how Google actually tries to square that circle. Um, Lisa, do you have any final comments or question? So I was just interested in in my initial question with, with, with Jason, but he has already answered that. And I don't think Leah has been able to rejoin, which is a great shame. But uh, in any case, uh, 
if you have anything final you want to have over your chest, otherwise I think we'll draw to a close. I think I think we will. I think everyone has been fantastically candid, which is exactly what I was hoping for. And you know, I've seen the audience going up to eighty uh, to a hundred people over a hundred, which is remarkable for a late a late afternoon uh, seminar. But there is a need for these kind of sort of testimony or discussion because otherwise people here do not actually have any visibility. So yeah, I'm very grateful, let me say, to Megan, to Jason and to Leah for, for joining at short notice. And uh, who knows, maybe we will do another one at the end of the trial and try and all guess where we uh, when where we'll end. But thank you so much. And thank you, Lisa, for hosting. And thank you very, very much for such a, a, a great webinar. It will be made uh, live in uh, Pickle's YouTube channel. OK. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.